Aloha. Welcome to Talk Story with John Waihe. And those of you who have watched us from time to time know that every once in a while I'd like to take advantage of a few friends and just uh, have a conversation, a kind of freewheeling conversation about the state of affairs in our nation and in our state. And, uh, you know, I, so I, I, I have these uh, people on call, and for this afternoon, we are going to be talking to Jay Fidel. Now, Jay is the one of the founders, if not the main founder, of uh, Tink Tech Hawaii. And so he has been doing a lot of shows that deal with the issues of the day. And he is especially fond about talking about the, uh, our, our president. Uh, he, like, he's very fond of doing that. Now, I didn't say he was very fond of the president, but he's very fond of doing that. So I thought it would be fun to have Jay with us today. And the title of our show is Apocalyptic America. And the reason for that is because we are becoming so concerned about what's happening in our country that doesn't even resemble the types of things that we were taught in elementary school about the advantages of the American democracy. And the question for all of us is, where is all of this going to end up? What happens by the end of the 21st century? with our country, with our state, and, you know, ultimately with our planet. So, why don't you help me greet my guest this afternoon, Jay Fidel from Tink Tech Hawaii, and he is sitting uh, at his, for his own computer. So, Jay, welcome. Welcome. You know, every once in a while, I like to do these fun shows with you, and here we well, are. I sure enjoy doing them with you, John. And thanks for having me on. There's so much to discuss, and um, we should be candid about uh, about uh, apo apocalyptic America with a K. Uh, yeah, with a K. Not everybody, is. not everybody is, but we should be. <laughs> well, you know, here we are. Look, 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 look at what's happening. We got uh, 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 a. Uh, a, re, a, a political party and a president, not the entire, not necessarily uh, all in step, but the, moving s us, this whole country, so far to the right. And it's being opposed by a group of, by the Democratic Party, who doesn't uh, even, uh, who has made the idea of democratic socialism fashionable. We've got candidates openly saying, I'm a Democrat, openly saying this. So, you know, where's all this polarization uh, leading to, Jay? You got any idea what uh, what might be in store for us? I think we have a, a huge divide in the country, uh, polarized uh, in so many ways. Uh, it's not only wealth disparity, it's uh, all kinds of social issues. And, and it precedes Trump. He takes advantage of it. He understands it. He makes the breach wider. Um, but, you know, the country has been sort of going polar, polar, polarized, oh gosh, for 30, 40 years. Uh, I think it started at the end of uh, Vietnam or even during the Vietnam War. But now it's really accentuated, isn't it? And yeah. Trump has done a marvelous job in accentuating it only in the past three years. Well, you know, I just had a conversation, what, two days ago with a friend of mine who is a conservative Republican, and but not necessarily a Trump supporter, but a conservative Republican. And what he kept emphasizing to me was that in his mind, Obama was as bad as Trump because of all the, in the word that he used, because of all the socialist things that he did. And I, I, I really couldn't, <laughs> I didn't know offhand what, or I don't know offhand what Obama did that was so socialistic. So I asked him that. I said, well, what are you talking about? Well, national health care. Socialistic platform that builds on the insurance company. What, what you, you know, do you think, uh, well, first of all, do you think... Uh, uh, that uh, Trump was preceded by eight years of rampant socialism? I, I, I can't you know, see it. I, um, 
you know, uh, every good dictator likes to have a scapegoat. Matter of fact, I think it's essential to emerge, to rise up as a dictator. You have to find scapegoats. I mean, it was clear what Hitler did. He found a number of scapegoats, including but not limited to the Jews, the Catholics, the gypsies, uh, the homosexuals. The um, socialists. You know, he, 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 played, he played on scapegoating. And that's exactly what Trump does. The division helps him. He plays on you know, pitting one side uh, against another. But, you know, the fact is it's fertile ground in this country as never before. And, and I think you have to ask yourself, why? Why is it fertile ground now? I guess an easy answer would be, you know, you were talking about things you learn in elementary school about, uh, you know, a representative government, and uh, maybe a lot of people didn't learn it that well. I think, I think a good part of this country didn't learn it that well. Or if they did learn it, they didn't like it. And they didn't, and, and they forgot it immediately, and they've been, you know, torn away from it now. And uh, they don't understand about three branches of government. They don't understand the miracle of the Constitution. They don't understand what the founders had in mind. They don't understand the social compact. You can't have a country without a general understanding of, you know, fundamental rights and fundamental privileges and fundamental mm, fundamental respect for humanity for the next guy, caring about the polity and the community. And I think we lost that somewhere. Well, Actually, you know, it's interesting. Recently. It's interesting that we just had a, as you know, and we can't, the elephant in this conversation, is we just had an impeachment process. I don't know if you should actually call it a trial, but it was an impeachment process, which our founding fathers, American founding fathers, uh, established as a way to bring balance uh, and, and, uh, or at least uh, avoid the excesses of, of power. And it was absolutely interesting that the entire process turned out to be a study of power. Those that had the vote got an absolute result that they, uh, that we, they looked for. And those that didn't just got left behind. I mean, could you see, for example, what happened to the the leaders like Everett Dirksen and other uh, great uh, American statesmen of the uh, Republican Party? I mean, where are those people that'll stand up for right no matter what? Uh, we had one in the case of Romney, I believe, but that's, you know, didn't move or, too much or beyond that. McCain. But, but you, know, um, you know, years ago, when, when you and I came up, we thought that Washington and the Capitol, especially the Capitol, were, were, were filled with uh, very important people who um, deserved to be there, who understood the mechanics of government, who understood what it was to represent the people and constituents and all that. Uh, and to to make good policy decisions and and make make the government responsible to implement them, um, you know it was uh, I had a lot of respect for the people in Congress when I when I grew up and when I went to law school and looked at it from afar, but I I don't have respect for them anymore. I, I do respect the Democrats. I want to say Adam Schiff is my hero. I mean, you know, as a as a lawyer, you know, if you listen to the arguments he made. Uh, they were brilliant and they were well articulated. It was a masterful work of, of bringing out the evidence and uh, explaining the evidence and persuading on the evidence. But I must say the Republicans don't fit in the category. The, the Republicans are not people you can admire as a group. Uh, what they did in this impeachment, what they have done in so many ways, like, uh, like confirming judges uh, who were not qualified by sitting on bills that the country needed, um, you know, by, by refusing to uh, consider any initiative by the Democrats. I mean, that's, that's not what it's about. Uh, those guys don't understand how Congress should work. Well, They're really what, out of it. You know, what happened right after the trial, what's happening right now, is a whole, a lot of retaliations going on. People are getting fired. They're getting replaced by, there's yeah. a kind of a movement toward a, the purity of the administration branch. And, and Congress is going along with this. Where is this balance of power? Uh, well, I, I think that the Constitution, forgive me, but I, 
I think the Constitution is under profound attack. It may never recover. Um, you have you have uh, the Senate is completely dysfunctional, thus making the Congress dysfunctional. You have the president uh, enhancing his power, violating the law in plain sight. Uh, you know, he could shoot somebody in Fifth Avenue. Nothing would happen to him. And he's, he's done a lot of crime and nothing has happened to him and nothing will happen to him. And this this uh, acquittal in the impeachment process, as you say, is a lesson to into this government, this country and all who follow. Oh, this and guy, this guy. Means... President. We're, we're really busted here, John. Well, I tell you what, this guy's uh, charges and the evidence against him made uh, Richard Nixon look like a, a school school kid compared yeah. to uh, what he's been charged with. I mean, using a foreign power to influence an election and then not, there is no repercussion for it because, well, he didn't really mean to do that. You know, and and all, and 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 worse. I I I just uh, well, worse so the is real Congress. He has body blocked, stonewalled Congress at every turn, not only on this but on so many other things. Think back to the Mueller investigation. He did the same thing on that, and uh, and and completely suborning the uh, uh, the Attorney General. He he owns the Attorney General of the country. So if somebody does create a crime, somebody does. If, uh, do a crime, including him, uh, the attorney general is never going to prosecute unless Trump says so. Um, so, you know, what you have is a, is a complete uh, breakdown. And we've had it for a while, but now it's, it's much worse. And how can you rely on this government to do what it's supposed to do? You know, to me, the question is, where, where do we go from here? How can we actually survive as a democracy I was just going to ask you that question because, you know, we're talking about the stuff that makes the headlines uh, uh, recently, made the headlines recently. But this is an administration that's undercut environmental protection, uh, is uh, simultaneously as uh, as we're going through the impeachment trial, uh, we're we're, uh, putting judges in positions uh, that they weren't qualified for, putting people in positions that they weren't qualified for. I mean, it's over and over and over again. And they seem, everything seems to smack of money. It's all about the dollars. You know, you play, you pay to play. Pay to play is just, uh, it's accepted. It's accepted, you know? What do you, what do you do? Accepted and it will be accepted going forward all the more. So if, if I, let me ask you a question, John. You know, given the obstruction, clearly we have had that. Um, given, um, you know, the whole affair in Ukraine um, uh, and, and given the nature of it and, and, the, and Donald Trump's, um, you know, his responses, his various responses to various criminal charges against him. Um, is, does it stop there? I mean, to me, it, it's worse that he obstructed than, than he played with the, the 491 million and used it as a lever. Uh, well, I tell you what. really offensive. But I, I believe, be- and I'm asking you if you believe, whether that's the limit of it. Um, well, I tell you I, what, I I'm going to help you out. We are other- going to dwell in that answer in a, in a minute when we get back from this short break. Aloha, I'm Lillian Cumi, host of Lillian's Vegan World, the show where we talk about veganism and the plant-based diet located in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm a vegan chef and cooking instructor, and I have lots of uh, information to share with you about how awesome this plant-based diet is. So do tune in every second Thursday from 1 p.m. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, the host of Hawaii Together on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Hawaii Together deals with the problems we face in paradise and looks for solutions, whether it's with the economy, the government, or society. We're streamed live on ThinkTech bi-weekly at 2 p.m. on Mondays. I want to thank you so much for watching. We look forward to seeing you. Again, I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Welcome back to Talk Story with John Waihe'e. We just ended our short break and we have as our guest this afternoon, 
Jay Fidel, and Jay was just leading into a most interesting discussion. He actually posed the question for the host. And he, uh, as a host himself, we, we sort of take turns doing this. And he's asking me, Jay, hit it. What are you asking me? Well, given what's happened, given what we've seen of, of Donald Trump and this, this particular administration and what he's done and how he's covered up the things he wants to cover up and, and kept things secret and the way he's uh, uh, undermined the press, for example, and undermined the truth, alternative facts, what have you, is do we know the extent of this? We, we don't know what Bolton would say. There, there could be all kinds of stuff there. And, and my intuition, I'm asking about yours, is that there are other criminal activities that this president has undertaken, which we don't know about, and we may never know about. But I feel in my heart, and I'm asking you how, what you feel in your heart, that there's well, much I, more. Well, I agree with you. I think there's much more. I think we've only seen, uh, the, as they say, the tip of the iceberg. And if people dig uh, deeper. Now, one of the interesting phenomenons that are happening is that you know, his, his, his strength on the Republican uh, in the, for those, among those individual citizens who, called, who identified themselves as Republican has remained pretty strong. It's, it's lessened. It's, it's taken a few hits. And among the Democrats, obviously, they're you know, almost united against him. But among the people who consider themselves independents or free thinkers, there's been a kind of a major shift. And I think that when Donald doesn't have the same usefulness that he currently has, you know what's interesting about this president is that he may be as uh, or worse. He may be actually worse than we might believe, in, in as you as you suggest. But he's also useful to a whole bunch of other people's agendas. Uh, there are those, for example, Mitch McConnell. I, I can see Mitch sitting down with the president and basically saying, you know, you bring me the right kind of judges and I'll make sure that you stick around to keep appointing them. I can see uh, the big oil, uh, big money people uh, uh, in this country saying, you know, you let us uh, do what we want and make a fortune and uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep backing you up. Now, at some point in time, some point in time, the power is going to shift. And the question for that, I, that I, my answer is couched. And, and when that happens, when that happens, I believe that uh, people are going to make him uh, pay the piper. But um, what do you do? I, I, have, um, I have some very close relatives, people I admire who uh, tell me that they will never, never not support Trump, <clears throat> our current president, because of their belief, their religious belief, uh, about uh, the sanctity of life. And as long as he says that uh, he is going to do, whether it's true or effective, or he can actually do it or not, but as long as he keeps uh, saying that he's going to, um, uh, you know, going to be anti-choice, they will always vote for him. They don't even want to, they don't even care. I had somebody actually, this person tell me that, you know, God, in the Bible, God picked uh, kings who weren't the best people, but he used them to do good things. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, but he also dumped a couple, uh, a whole bunch of them when they messed up. So, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe the Lord's going to get tired of this guy sometime, you know, <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, to answer your question, hey, well, here we are, Jay. We're talking about all of this stuff going on at the national level. But here, in, right here in Hawaii, we have had a police chief. Uh, put on trial for corruption. We've had all of this things going on. We got at least three active protests. What's happening in Hawaii? 
I mean, how does that happen? We're not in the Trump spectrum of politics, so how do we get to where we are? You'd be a great guy to address that, John, because I think it's a question of leadership. It's a question of the governor, Um, not only, you know, to sign proclamations or, um, you know, accept or veto, uh, approve or veto legislation, um, but to be a a moral center uh, to give us guidance, give us leadership, um, bring us together when we have to come together, help us focus on the priorities. And if you don't have anybody doing that, things get scattered. And right now, I'd say they're completely scattered. Uh, they're, they're scattered on a, the fiscal end. We, we, we can't afford the rail. And we also, now we can't afford fixing uh, Blaisdell uh, Center either. Um, we have uh, unfunded liabilities, uh, enormous uh, enormous amounts of unfunded liabilities, which will catch us. Um, we have a fragile economy that's that's based on um, you know uh, tourism only, uh, and if uh, anything got in the way of that, like a virus, and people stopped coming here, ho, oh, there would be an economic crash in almost no time. So we need leadership, and and um, right now I I think I think we're very fragile, very exposed. Well, because you know, let's take let's take uh, let's take uh, uh, an issue like that. Let's let's take uh, you know uh, we we'll talk about leadership. There's an election coming up. It's an opportunity for us to, as voters, as participants, to step up and um, you know uh, vote some leadership into at least the mayoral race. And so, um, uh, you know, how how does that happen? I mean. What I, I I don't know where to go with it, frankly. I, I don't know what uh, kind of what would be the ideal leader in your in your. I don't want to ask you who you're supporting or who's running. I understand. Uh, well, I I think uh, you know. I think actually, I used to say that nobody should run for the legislature un, until he had finished or she had finished the uh, legislation 101. But that, that's, that's a fictitious course that doesn't exist. Right. But, but the idea is that you have to have some experience in legislation. And actually, although people always make fun, I think lawyers make better legislators. That's just because of their education. They understand the, you know, the nature of government, the nature of, of laws. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, I think a lot of lawyers would never consider running for the legislature. Well, I think a lot, uh, a lot of qualified people would never consider running for any office in the state of Hawaii. It's well, dangerous business. It doesn't pay that well. And uh, for your efforts, you, you know, you, you get hurt. Well, so you, you um, know, uh, what I, I was going to ask you, situation here. you, you talked about lawyers, but one of the tendencies of lawyers might be the fact that they don't like change. You know, this the whole basis of the legal foundation has to do with what we could we refer to in law school as stare decisis. And usually if you have a bad decision, stare decisis means you keep making the same bad decision. So I, I, I you know, where where do we find people who, you know, Bob Oshiro, who is a friend of mine and one of the you know, I believe heroes of contemporary Hawaii used to always talk about the dignity of political involvement, that it, uh, it was actually a higher calling. I mean, how many people actually believe that, you know, that they're there to do good as opposed to, uh, well, let me, let me be controversial. You know, I, I had some of the legislators come, uh, came out the last session and I said, well, what did you do? And they said, uh, we balanced the budget. And I thought to myself, you know, that's, that gets you a C in my book. That gets you a C because basically in our, under our constitution and laws, we couldn't spend an unbalanced, unbalanced budget anyway. We're cash financed uh, ultimately. What we need to do is look at how we spend it. You know, what are we investing in? Who are we doing? Um, it seems to me, anyway, uh, that Hawaii is going through a kind of a crisis. We, we're, we're trying to figure out uh, what, uh, what our values are. You know, it, it, it's the, we are right in the middle of the 2020 census, 
And what the census is going to show us is that um, more Native Hawaiians live on the mainland or on the continent, I should say, or elsewhere than live here on, in the islands. And I'll bet that if we add the data, it'll also show that more people who grew up here live elsewhere than in Hawaii at this point in time. So the real question ought to be every time we do a project, every time we build a, 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 rail, a, a railroad from on the island, every time we develop uh, high rises in Kaka'ako, we ought to ask ourselves, who benefits? Who are the benefits? Who benefits by the fact that, for example, I grew up in Waimea, which on the Big Island, which was a sleepy town. It's great. It looks like Napa Valley. And so we now have all kinds of people moving in, but the taxes have gone up so high that uh, local people are going to Vegas. You know, where uh, energy costs, the rest of it. Are we going through a time when people are starting to reassess the values that uh, government is supposed to adhere, as well as the yeah. fact that we sure would like some leadership? We, we've had this conversation about the brain drain and, uh, you know, the, the hollowing out of our middle class and, and uh, the lack of housing for, oh, how long, John? It's a long time. And um, I think that, you know, at, at this point, um, I think, I actually think we've we've talked ourselves out, and it's time for action. Uh, it's time for somebody to you know put a toe in the water and actually. Well, we got we got we got one about. minute. We, I got a minute left. Give me some hope. This has been a too dark uh, too dark a conversation. Are well, there any signs of things getting better, either nationally or locally? My, my hope is that the millennials will get into politics that they will understand what you and I have been talking about. Uh, they will understand both at the state level and the federal level. Uh, they'll realize that the system can be made to work, that they can participate in it, and that government is no good without the people and the people are no good without government. Uh, each one must engage with the other. And when they learn that lesson, they'll be a powerful force, maybe more powerful than the previous generation. So my optimistic view of it is that somewhere along the line and somewhere soon, I hope, uh, the millennial crowd, the young people will understand that they need to get involved, you know, in the community at a political level. So we're going to be the old guys that invite in the young guys for a change, not like our parents who thought that we were crazy. <laughs> <in the city. laughs> right. Anyway, thank you very much, Jay. I really appreciated having you on in this conversation. Well, the thought for apocalyptic America is that fortunately we have a new generation and they might save us all. Aloha and we'll see you in two weeks.